This is a presentation of our paper, Deep Probabilistic Modeling of Glioma Growth, which was published at MICAI 2019. Now, glioma, and especially its high-grade form, glioblastoma, is the most common malignant brain cancer, and it typically offers very poor prognosis for patients in its later stages, which is easy to understand when you see what uh, an affected brain might look like. One characteristic of these tumors that is especially important for our work is the fact that they exhibit highly irregular growth patterns. So, for example, well, for one patient, the tumor size might increase more or less linearly over time. Um, the same could be true for another patient up to some point in time, but then uh, in a very short amount of time, the tumor size will grow dramatically. We're assuming that this is not a deterministic process and that the same could have happened to the first patient. So our goal is to model a distribution of all the possible changes that could take place after a number of uh, observations for a given patient. Most existing approaches that try to model glioma growth do this using a reaction diffusion model, meaning the tumor is represented as a cell density that evolves over time following a diffusion equation where the additional reaction term dictates cell proliferation. These approaches are almost always deterministic and require strong assumptions to be encoded into this equation, while we're basically trying to do the opposite. We replace manual modeling with an approach that learns the dynamics entirely from data, and because we assume that tumor growth is not a deterministic process, we're no longer asking the question, what will happen, but instead ask, what are all the different things that could happen? Before we get into the details of our approach, it's important to understand what kind of data we're working with. For a given patient and a given point in time, we have four co-registered MRI contrasts with different characteristics, meaning a 3D volume with four channels. We also have a segmentation map that tells us the size and location of different tumor tissues. And our approach takes the scans from two consecutive time points and predicts the distribution over segmentations for the next. So how does that work? We basically start with a regular unit that sees the input scans. We then have a second network called the prior encoder that sees the same input and predicts the parameters of a Gaussian distribution from which we can sample. The sample is then injected into the unit a few layers before the final output to produce a segmentation. For training, we use a cross entropy loss to compare with the observed future segmentation. We also have a third network that is almost identical to the prior encoder, but that also sees the future segmentation. This is called the posterior encoder, and we use the kolbach leibler divergence to force prior and posterior distributions towards each other, so that at test time, the prior models meaningful variations in the segmentations. This architecture is called the probabilistic unit and was originally used to model annotation variations, for example, from different experts. And we're now trying to see if we can also capture temporal changes. I want to reiterate that we're assuming that multiple growth trajectories are possible, and that the observed future doesn't have to be the likeliest one under the true distribution that we're trying to approximate. What's more, the patients in our dataset receive treatment, meaning tumor shrinkage also occurs, so that on average, the most likely change is almost no change at all. So how do we know whether the predicted distributions from a model are any good? We considered two measures for that. The first is what we call the query volume dice. We basically sweep the predicted distribution and take the sample that best matches the observed segmentation in size and compute their dye similarity. The second makes use of the posterior encoder we use for training and measures the KL divergence between the prior and the posterior. We call that the surprise because it gives us an idea of how much the model has to adjust the prior to account for the observed segmentation. Unfortunately, these metrics don't really apply to the diffusion growth models I mentioned in the beginning, so we have to find another frame of reference for how well our model performs. We do that by constructing bounds on the performance we expect. A lower bound would be given by a model that is just trained to segment its input, but is then evaluated on future segmentations. That bound represents a case that our model hasn't captured any temporal information. As an upper bound, we can take a model that is trained and evaluated on future scans and segmentations, which from the perspective of our model is basically an oracle that can see into the future. Before we check the numbers, let's look at a few examples of what our approach is able to do. On the left, you see a present input scan with the current tumor outlined with a solid line. The right-hand side shows the same for the future, and the dotted line on the left represents the segmentation from the learned distribution 
that best matches the future in size. The two are remarkably close, meaning our model is able to capture growth quite well. The same is true for shrinkage, which is something many of the biological growth models can represent. What our model fails at are combinations of the two, meaning the tumor shrinks in one place but grows in another. Because we can only really evaluate our approach in cases that exhibit a considerable amount of change over time, we define two groups. The large change group, which are the 10% of cases with the largest change, and the moderate change group, which are the cases with above average change that are not in the first group. Looking at the query volume dice, our model isn't much better than the lower bound for cases with moderate change, but for cases with a large change, we see a significant difference. For the surprise, our model is on par with the upper bound for moderate change and still much better than the lower bound for cases with large change. That essentially means we found that probabilistic segmentation can indeed be used to model meaningful growth trajectories. These are learned directly from data, completely model-free. We also saw that both growth and shrinkage can be captured when they're present in the training data. The obvious downside being that we actually need to have a pretty large amount of training data to begin with. We have open sourced our code on GitHub and put the paper on archive. There are a lot of details missing in this video, so I would encourage you to have a look. And if you still have questions, do feel free to reach out. Thank you.